So hello, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome. My name is Samantha Shokin. I manage public programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. Um, thank you for joining us for today's book launch of All the Horrors of War by Dr. Bernice Lerner. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome our guest for today. Uh, Dr. Bernice Lerner is the author of The Triumph of Wounded Souls and co-editor of Happiness and Virtue Beyond East and West Toward a New Global Responsibility. She is a senior scholar at Boston University Center for Character and Social Responsibility and the former Dean of Adult Learning at Hebrew College. Her new book, All the Horrors of War, is out now with Johns Hopkins University Press. And I'm very pleased to welcome our special guest for today, uh, who will be moderating the conversation, Dr. Michael Berenbaum. Dr. Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teaching consultant in the conceptual development of museums and the development of historical films. He is currently director of the Sigi Ziering Institute at the American Jewish University, where, is, where he is a professor of Jewish studies. Dr. Berenbaum's most prominent work in the museum world was directing the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial, and he was also part of the curatorial team that developed the Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away exhibit at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. So, so thank you, Bernice, Michael, for joining us, uh, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Samantha. Let me begin by saying that we're meeting at a historic moment, which is 75 years ago tomorrow was the liberation of Bergen-Belsen uh, by British troops and was the work in which, um, which Bernice wrote um, so powerfully of. Uh, Bergen-Belsen was um, an important camp that was over flooded by the people who had been death marched from Auschwitz, what the Nazis called forced evacuation. And by the time Bergen-Belsen was liberated, the camp was in the midst of enormous typhus epidemic. Uh, and it was so great an epidemic that 13,000 people died after the liberation. And Bernice uh, has written powerfully of it, but I'm going to let her tell us uh, the basic outlines of her story and the basic way in which um, uh, she's worked. First of all, Bernice, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. I've been reading you and we've been talking a little bit, but uh, I haven't seen you face to face. Uh, tell me, tell the audience and me a little bit about your background and what brought you to this moment. Hmm. to write the book? Uh, so I am the daughter of Holocaust survivors. Um, so I've, I've long been interested in their stories and in about the Holocaust. I taught uh, for many years, I taught the Holocaust or related subjects at Boston University. And I had written um, a book that I turned, a dissertation that I turned into a book, The Triumph of Wounded Souls, about seven Holocaust survivors' lives. And then I turned my attention to a question that I just didn't have the answer to, which was how was my mother actually rescued? How, did, how was her life saved? How did she go from this dung infested hut to this makeshift hospital? And that led me to really look into the liberation, how exactly, what happened and what took place. And that took me to Glenn Hughes, to the man who was responsible for spearheading the uh, liberation, the relief efforts. And so that's, that's my background. That's how I came to begin to write this story. But um, in terms of what this historic moment is, 75 years ago today is uh, at Bergen-Belsen is something that we should talk about and we should remember, but I really tremble in doing so because it was impossible to imagine. I have not read or heard a single account by a survivor or by a liberator that didn't have the word in it indescribable. It was just indescribable and no matter what film you saw, no matter what picture, no matter what you read, they, and even in my book where I do have some accounts of people trying so hard to describe it, to picture the scene, even Glenn Hughes, like picture what it's like when this hut door opens. It's very hard to imagine, but I can just give you some, what, what it looked like. So today was the, today's April 14th. April 14th, 1945, 
there were 41,000 people in Camp One in the horror camp of Bergen-Belsen who had been there for a period of time. You couldn't survive very long. 17,000 to 18,000 people had died in the month of March, and there were uh, including we should we we should tell our our audience that includes Anne Frank and her sister. Yeah, Margot. I calculate that Anne Frank and Anne Frank died probably. She was the same age as my mother. She was a little bit older than my mother. I think she died a week uh, within a week or two of my mother's arrival in the camp. And it was just the norm was death. That was the norm. As Michael said, there was a raging typhus epidemic. There was also an epidemic of tuberculosis and gastroenteritis. When P when the British came in on the fifteenth, they no British doctor was able to tell what how many diseases people were suffering from. So um, so April 14th, what did it look like? People were languishing in their huts. They were dying, dying by the thousands, out in the open, shambling if they were starved, inside the barracks if they were suffering from disease. And there was a I'm failed gonna, attempt. I'm going to throw you a curveball, um, which is that um, those of you who read this book will read of a Herculean medical effort to save human life. Uh, and that's one of the characters that you introduce into this book enormously powerfully, and we'll have you, we'll have you talk about him for a moment. Uh, but one of the things that struck, uh, we're all reading, we'll all read about a Herculean medical effort through the lens of our own current experience. Tell us, uh, and you're telling us, uh, really the conditions that the doctors faced, the decisions that they had to make, and then the improvised planning that was involved in that. Because uh, I don't think that at any other time had I read the book, and I've now read the book twice, I would have paid attention to that as much as I did today uh, and this week, and all of a sudden, wow, wow. and what awesome respect. But go ahead, I'm sorry, Bernice. Yeah, but so I, I, I like, like you, Michael, even I wrote it, and it didn't register with me as much as it's registering now that we're in the midst of this pandemic. So I find a lot of things, a lot of parallels. Of course, the circumstances were very different and that was isolated in one place. But the things that, I, that resonate for me now is sort of the shock and the unpreparedness. Like it was shocking for the British Second Army. They had never seen or experienced anything like this. They were not prepared. They were told a lie. They were told by the Germans that there were 1,500 typhus cases, there were probably 15 times that number. They did, They were scrambling, like today, we're scrambling for supplies. They're, we're scrambling now for ventilators and for PPEs, protective equipment, and they were scrambling then for beds, and they set up the largest hospital, hospital in Europe very quickly for like 13,000 beds. And they were scrambling, they didn't even have thermometers. They were really scrambling and trying to innovate every step of the way. Um, like today, we had to call for emergency help from the National Guard, from FEMA. They had to call, Glenn Hughes right away had to call for emergency help to impress upon the British Second Army that there was a humanitarian crisis here and he needed to, the war was still raging, people were still fighting, but he needed to bring in as much help as he could and they even used and recruited German nurses and doctors. Uh, which was awful for the inmates, but they had to, whoever could come. The other thing that is common between these two catastrophes is that the use of medical students, bringing in medical students who were not yet graduated. Here we're doing that in this country, we're graduating them several months early to help in the effort. There they brought in 97 medical school students from London medical schools. And what is it like really for these young doctors? They're, they're made to do anything and everything then and now. Now they have to scrub down and disinfect rooms between, patient, between patients coming in, COVID patients. Then they had to 
were hosed down huts with creosol, a disinfectant, and they had to they had to set up little makeshift hospitals, little hospitals. So whatever these are, are the heroes on the front lines, and they're called to do whatever is asked of them. The other thing well, that was I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Bernice, you've described a little physicians created a special man. Uh, and I described the very Oh, Michael, you're breaking up. Has any Uh, uh, Michael, um, it might I'm be a, back an, I'm back in. Okay. There it is. Great. I'm back in. Did you hear the question? Uh, no, I missed uh, it. Uh, Bernice, uh, I said, you're describing the conditions. Now tell us a little bit about the man, uh, okay. because you really okay. admire him and wonder uh, you know, ah, Michael's I, breaking up again. Okay, think. I think Michael, you asked me to tell you about the man about Glenn Hughes. Is that anybody could be equal to that hour. Yeah. So I became really interested in him, and uh, the first thing when I discovered him was to find out if he was biography worthy and so many people had such wonderful things to say about him as a human being that I started to go really deeper into his life, track down his, his family, his daughter, his schools. I went to London several times to do research. I think I wrote, I read almost everything that he wrote and everything that was written about him as much as I could. And he was a very interesting compelling character to me. He was almost like an Oscar Schindler type of person in some respects, in that he had tremendous empathy for the people he was seeing. He was, he was mature. He was 52 years old when he came into the camp. He had seen all the horrors of war. He had seen nothing to touch this. And he broke down crying. He was very human. And the survivors felt his warmth and they felt his caring, the ones who were working with him at a pretty high level to try to get the support and help. And they named the hospital after him, the Glenn Hughes Hospital. So now there's probably, if they're all alive, there's probably at least 2,000 people walking this earth who are between 75 and 80 years old who were born in the Glenn Hughes Hospital. And um, he, he was a really interesting character because he was not political at all. It was a real, um, crisis in terms of anti-Semitism after the war. British anti-Semitism uh, was sort of rekindled because the survivors in the displaced persons camp were agitating to get into Palestine. And for political reasons, the British officials didn't like that. And he was sort of not involved in that, in the fray at all. And he he was actually a great champion of the survivors and their cause, and by extension, the Jewish people, the land of Israel. He went to visit Israel many times after the war, and he, he saw people in the Israeli military as his heroes. So he was kind of an unusual character. So I tried to delve into his background to find out sort of what made him the way he was. So all of that. And, and you wrote but you wrote a dual biography, so introduce the other character. The other character, so I was working on Glenn Hughes, and I was, my colleagues and friends were like, oh, but your mother's story is so interesting. So I thought, could I, uh, could I write a dual biography? Could I write her story and his story? So the other character is my mother. So like I mentioned, she was a little bit younger than Anne Frank. She was 14 when she was deported to Auschwitz. She was 15 at the end of the war. And in order to write her story, I had to sort of remove myself a little bit from the emotional connection and from my feelings of mother-daughter and look at who was this little girl? Who was this young girl? What, just like I asked about Rick Glenn Hughes, what dispositions and habits and attitudes did he bring? What 
biological endowments did he have that he brought to this extreme? What did she bring? What did this kid bring? And she was very different than an Anne Frank. She had a very hard scrabble childhood and did that in some way prepare her for the hardships. But how, what did she make of what she was seeing? What did she think and feel as she was exposed to? She witnessed and she endured on her own skin these depredations and horror. Well, let, let, let's also set up a couple of things with, with your mother. Number one, she's from Saget. And Saget obviously became famous because of Elie Wiesel and our depiction of Saget uh, in one sense is skewed because we don't have any physical description of the town and we really have a description of a couple of characters from Saget. But you give us a, a visual description of the town and a, a sense of, of a little bit more of what life was in Saget. That meant that your mother was deported in uh, May of 1944. And this entire experience of hers occurs literally over 11 months. Give us a little bit of what happened to her in those 11 months. Yeah, so the, the entire book is told over one year because it was so eventful. Just like we could not have imagined like a month ago, the coronavirus taking over our lives. That's how shocking, how quickly things changed. And it continued to change. The events of war drove these two people, Glenn Hughes from the West and my mother from the East to this God forsaken place in Northwest Germany. So um, in that, so Siget, to answer your question, it was just a beautiful town. It was 40% Jewish. There was about 11,500 people living there. There was more brought in from the surrounding area into the ghetto. Um, and it was just, I was there last year at this time, and it was, it's such a charming town. It's Siget means island, and it's surrounded by mountains. And my mother as a kid was, it was a perfect place, perfect sized little town to explore as a, as a kid. You could go, you could go down all these streets and alleys, and she was very street smart. She was the second of six children, and she had a lot of responsibility in her family. She was delivering orders for her grandmother, who was a butcher, and so she knew every nook and cranny in the town. But who would have thought it was such a shock, the whole, the way it was done, and the way the Jews were rounded up and deported, and the things I discovered in my research were just so shocking in a way how they they brought in they just to give you one example instead of they the policemen just in the town of Siget they brought in these Hungarian gendarmes from different regions they switched their locales so they wouldn't have any personal connection with the people to whom they were being so brutal and, and rounding them up let, let me so, give let me uh, I'm a I'm a pen and neck historian let me just um, set the context for one moment. Um, the Germans entered, um, uh, Hungary was essentially um, only touched in a minor way by the Holocaust until 1944. Uh, early in, in Hungary, they deported foreign Jews. Those of you who read Night, that means Moshe the Beetle. They brought them to Kamenitz Podolsk and they shot them. Most of the Beatle was one of the people who came back. Uh, but Hungary was virtually, and they sent some Jewish men, including, I guess it's your grandfather, off to slave labor uh, camps. Uh, but again, there was no final solution imposed on Hungary. Germans invaded March 19th. In April and May, the Jews were ghettoized. And then all of a sudden, between the 15th of May and the 8th of July, 437,402 Jews were deported. Now, that essentially means you're dealing with um, a period from March to May where you're persecuted and ghettoized, and then May to July, in which you are sent primarily overwhelmingly to Auschwitz. This is an intensity 
virtually unknown anywhere else from during the Holocaust. Contrast it with Poland, you had uh, a year and a half, two years, almost three years in the ghetto. And in Hungary, you're talking about a matter of days and, uh, and weeks, not months. So your mother's transition was, let's understate it, radical to say the least. So what she would say, what she always said to me growing up is she would say, cause she was a kid, right? She didn't know the, what was going on in the war. They didn't, you know, and there was no radio. She didn't have any knowledge except for her father was, had been away and he came home. So he, he had some knowledge, but what she would say from her perspective as a 14 year old was if someone were to tell you that in two months time, your entire family would be taken away. You would be taken away. Everything you knew and loved would be taken away. Your parents would be killed. Your siblings would be killed, murdered. You, had, you, you, you lost your home. You lost your family. You lost your friends. What would you, what would you make of that? That's, it was such a shock, such a shock that that rapidity with which they deported the Hungarian Jews and killed them killed masses of them, the majority, the vast majority upon their arrival in Auschwitz. And every part of it was horrible and traumatic from the cattle train ride to the arrival and to the shock of the arrival. And my mother had certain, uh, she was basically a person, a very strong person with a really, I would say a basically happy disposition in her life. But there were certain things that took her back to that shocking moment. She could never stand bright lights because when she arrived in Auschwitz, they were shining the bright, there were floodlights and they were, it was so bright. The way she said it is there was not a shadow in which you could hide. Certain things like that. She trained herself in the cattle wagon, not to need water. Every human being needs water, but she was 14 years old. She was very uh, disciplined and the, had the old water, the water, and they had two pails in the, in the wagon, and there was water for the old and the sick and the children. And they dumped it out, they, and then they dumped out the pail in which they urinated in, and they filled that with water. And she was so turned off that from that moment on, she swore off drinking water. And I don't think she could drink water until 60 years after the war. She couldn't drink straight water. So you have these sort of traumatic things from that shocking, shocking experience. That was, that was, that was so horrible. How much, your, how much of her story did you know going into writing the story? And how much did you discover in the process of writing? In other words, uh, did your mother talk about her experiences you were growing up? Did she share with you? Uh, did she wait a while before she spoke with you? She didn't wait a while because, but she waited a while before she told me the horrors of war. She didn't, we started our conversations from the time I was a little kid and I didn't want to go to bed. And if I asked her about her, her past, she had so many interesting stories. I could engage, I became like a qualitative researcher. I could keep her up and I could delay my bedtime. So she, t she had a very interesting, she had a childhood in Siget, which was an exotic place to me. And then she had 10 post-war years in Sweden when she came to her own and she healed. So she had been in these different countries and had these different experiences. So she, first she shared stories, really funny and interesting anecdotes. And then when I was a teenager, when I was the age she was, when things started to happen that were terrible in her life, then she, then she told, told me about it. In fact, I remember the moment we were in the downstairs and she was ironing, it was in the laundry room. I remember the moment that she put down the iron and she demonstrated for me physically how she, who was half dead, dragged bodies to a mass grave in Bergen-Belsen, who were 90% dead. Not all of them were completely dead. And I remember her, the, I remember her putting down the iron and showing me how, how that happened. So it was when I was a teenager that she started to really tell me. So I had a good framework. I knew a lot of the stories. 
but when I started to write the book, I got deeper and deeper into the details. And I was very fortunate that I had her alive and with me and I could ask her questions. And sometimes I would ask her, I would say, I hate to take you back to this painful moment, but when you were on the death march, do you remember what were you wearing? Can you describe to me what you were wearing? So we got deeper and deeper. And sometimes I would ask her a question in an email so she had time to think before she would answer. By, by the way, I have to tell you something that um, when I interview survivors, and I want to get to the depth of the story, I've learned that you have to ask very specific questions. And part of what you asked her is absolutely fabulous in terms of engaging the survivor because you didn't ask an abstract question. You asked a very concrete question, what were you wearing? Now, probably in her entire life, nobody asked her what she was wearing that day. And the only way she could answer that was in a flash for a moment to go back to that and say to herself, what the hell was I wearing that day? And that gets her back into the camp uniform. Um, just to, for our audience, it's the equivalent of if you're going out on your first date and you ask somebody, um, tell me about your background, they have a rehearsed narrative. They've told their background all the way through. But if you ask somebody, uh, take me to your room. What did your room look like as a child? All of a sudden, the only way they can grapple with that is to go back to their room and to begin to um, think about what it looked like. So you're asking her, what, how did you dress? What, what were you wearing? is an incredible thing. It's also a very womanly thing because women remember what they're wearing in a way that men seldom do. Mm. But well, go, go on, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, so that was part of what drove the writing of the book is my curiosity. And um, just, yeah, and anytime I would start to write a scene and I'd want to get a better sense of it, I could ask her or I could, try to read more about it or read other survivors accounts of what they were, what the place was like. And I was also was very curious about the other protagonist, Glenn Hughes, but I didn't have him to ask. I could just try to track down every living person who knew him and ask and read everything he wrote and try to try to piece together these lives as best I could and track them track where were they during that year and what were they thinking and what were they feeling so I, I, it's very hard to get it exact but i tried really hard so well you're trying really hard um comes across and part of what makes the book very interesting is you begin way back in world war one with the experience of glenn Hughes during the war and his experience of battle and all that that represented. You also then uh, trace him through each of the battles from um, the D-Day invasion all the way through until he came to Bergen-Belsen. And as I told you when we were speaking, I learned, um, I know quite a bit about the battles in the East, but I hadn't particularly followed the battles in the West. And you took us through every single battle, but also more importantly, the enormous preparations this man made for providing medical assistance uh, during the war um, under uh, enormously difficult conditions. Um, and how did you go about your research? Hmm. Well, first, I, I just want to say that I didn't want to write something, a straight history. I really love biography, and I think it's a way of reaching a wider audience. People become engaged in individual lives. And he was such a compelling character. And I tried to, tried to see through his lens, through his point of view, 
What were the things that were occupying him? What was concerning him as he was traveling through, as he was in charge? Of, he was deputy director of medical services for the Eighth Corps. And I, I discovered they fought the most fanatical Nazis, the Hitler Jugend. And what was he, what was he preparing? What was in his mind as he went through? So I could kind of track him and then really understand where he was coming from when he happened upon Bergen Belsen. But to do the research, is that the question is, did, how did I go about my research? So I went, he had, thankfully, thankfully his, uh, his wife had, when he died, he had like seven boxes of documents and papers. So I tracked them down in the archives. And that was kind of interesting because that well, his whole collection moved from one archives to the other. So from two trips to London, I was first visiting the archives at the Welcome Medical Library, then at the Royal Army Medical Corps Museum. But I tracked down his archives. I went to his places. I went to his schools that he went. And I went even into the transcript offices and just looked up whatever I could find out about him, interviewed his old cronies, his old friends who were in their 80s at the time I was interviewing them. And his daughter gave me a lot of information. I spent hours and hours with her. I was on the phone with his son. They both died since. So I began this research 15 years ago. He's, I've been living with Glenn Hughes for 15 years and discovering all kinds of things. And it was very hard to get a grasp on his life because he was probably, well, maybe Michael, maybe you're like this too. He was involved in a lot of things. He had a lot of activities, was involved in a lot of organizations, going to meetings every night. I don't know how he found time to sleep, but he was a major figure in rugby football and golf and with and general practitioner, the life of the general practitioner and OBGYNs in London. And he had just done so much. But finally, on the last couple of trips to London, his whole life kind of flashed before my eyes and I got the picture of almost from cradle to grave of this man and his life he was a noble person he was kind he was always for decency and fair play but he had troubles he had troubles like we all have troubles in our life so I was discovering over time I was sort of discovering maybe not all of it but a lot of it and I just really wanted to think about him and and also try to figure out what is it that makes someone so human, such a humanitarian. And that's what I'm hoping also that people will get out of this book because we all need heroes to emulate. We need their stories to keep in our mind in case we encounter the stranger. I mean, here he came into bergen Belsen and people looked like subhuman. They didn't look human. They were like skeletons. They were crawling on all fours. And he could sort of see the sacred human person. He was a doctor. And if he could, he would have treated the individual patient. But he had to make these big decisions, like how to triage. So I wanted to know what made him tick and what he came away with after this experience. Why did he feel so connected to the Jewish people? Why was he so involved with survivors? Why did he ask the rabbi who was at Bergen Belsen to say prayers for the martyrs of Belsen at his funeral. So yeah, I, I fell in love with him. And of course I love my mother, not of course, but I, I do love my mother. So I was really did not tire of this project that went on for 15 years. But 15 years of research resulted in a very short book. So. Um, uh Ah, uh, Michael's breaking up again. The word for a couple of seconds. Uh, okay. Um, we have on board, um, uh, hearing this, one of um, the country's most distinguished ethicists. Um, and I want to ask you, um, he had to engage, and all of these uh, medical officers had to engage in what we call triage today. And um, what were some of the dilemmas that were posed to them by the conditions in which they faced? Hmm. Could you hear the question? Yes, yes, yes. So um, the conditions were time constraints, time, lack, of, lack of resources, lack of manpower, human power, 
lack of time. Yeah, the army was really busy. How to bury, how to bury 10,000 dead, what to do. Like today, we're consumed with data. Like every day I'm reading reports on the number of COVID cases in various places. They were consumed with data. He was consumed with data. How do we stem the tide of death? 500 were dying each day for weeks after the British came in. But I just, yeah. I'll just, in terms of triage, I'll read you what Hughes wrote, what the decision he came to. Hughes knew that thorough diagnosis and elaborate treatment of individual patients would make it impossible to provide elementary care to greater numbers. The best chance to save the most was to place those who had a reasonable chance of survival under conditions in which their own tendency to recover could be aided by simple nursing. That's all they could provide. This involved placing former inmates into one of three categories. It was very simple, streamlined, focused, highly focused. Those likely to survive, those likely to die, and those for whom immediate care would mean the difference between life and death. The medical officers going into the huts would have to make a quick determination. Would the individual stand a better chance of surviving if evacuated to receive rudimentary care? Rescue efforts sprang from this principle. And today, recently in the Boston Globe, there was a message from doctors, nurses, and ethicists from Harvard Medical School's Center for Bioethics. And they wrote, they were forewarning, and it's happening for real in some places, of a transition to crisis standards of care involving a population-wide approach. You're not looking at the individual anymore. You're looking at the masses. The only way we can ensure that we ethically fulfill our responsibilities to all patients, hospitals would be unable to offer or continue ICU treatment or ventilator support to those who have a too poor prognosis to justify using those limited resources. This would deprive care to other patients for whom there is a greater likelihood of benefit. So now we have more, a little bit more time and more resources. Resources. We're not in that kind of a war. We are in a war against the coronavirus. But, but and his was more streamlined, more simple. Now there's more discussion about identifying levels for the triage, like. They have a rating scale of patients, like what number are you? That's, that determines whether you'll get the needed help. But there it was there, they, and they made a lot of mistakes. And I'm sure we're making mistakes here now too. They made a lot of mistakes. They left people for dead in the huts who might have been survived had they had care. And they took some people who died, who died anyway. In my mother's, my mother's makeshift hospital room, every day there were 12 beds, Every day, 11 died, and they brought in 11 nearly dead to fill the empty beds for three weeks. Let me say two things about burial at Bergen-Belsen, because part of what we see at burial at Bergen-Belsen is something incredible took place. Um, the dead were lying around for so long that the only way in which they were able to deal with them is they bulldozed them and put them into a mass grave. They had, as you wrote, they had uh, rabbis who said, uh, Rabbi Levy and uh, uh, said, uh, and Rabbi Levy is still alive today. We just interviewed him for a, a film on, on liberation. But um, he said the prayers, he said the Kel Malay Rachmim and the Kaddish, uh, only after they had bulldozed. But within less than a week, something else had happened, which is they had a Hevra Kedisha, which is the traditional Jewish burial society, and they were burying people individually. Uh, and that was um, part of the transition from the Holocaust to truncated life and freedom. Yeah. but they had sort of taken control of um, of the situation enough to individualize burial and therefore to give a sense of humanity and scope of life to those who died. 
I want you to do one more uh, thing for me only because um, I got a couple of emails from a friend of mine whose mother is mentioned in the book. Tell us about the work of uh, Hadassah Binko, um, who was a, a, a dentist at, at Bergen-Belsen, but ran um, a very special operation there. And uh, Glenn Hughes was enormously impressed with her work. Yeah, so Hadassah Bimko and Glenn Hughes. Hadassah was, um, was doing unbelievable work maintaining a hospital, a, a little a hospital barracks for children, caring for children that was hygienic. And she was doing the best she could in this place that was full of filth and disease. And um, she and Glenn Hughes was really impressed when he went in to see what her work and she was the one who actually gave him his first real tour of Bergen Belsen going into the huts going inside and they established some kind of bond and connection he asked her right away if she could corral uh, doctors nurses any medical personnel from among the inmates and she set about doing that right away and they became, they worked closely together. She worked closely with his senior medical officer, James Johnston at Bergen-Belsen. And they became, they became really lifelong friends from that moment on. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. So Menachem Rosenstaff, yeah. Uh, Menachem was one are, of the first people to tell me about Glenn Hughes as being a very worthwhile man to explore. And yeah. my friend Menachem was probably one of the first people to tell you about Hadassah's work. Yeah, and I've, of course, I've read Hadassah's book, and yeah, I've been, I'm familiar with her, but she did extraordinary work, and they, they became very close friends with Glenn Hughes. They made, yeah. Uh, we are now going to take questions, but I'm going to ask the first question, which is being asked by uh, Lori, which is an elemental, an elemental question, but not unimportant which is how can we purchase the book and would you uh, uh, hold it up so we can see it? Yeah. Please. Yeah. So here it is. It's All the Horrors of War. And this is by Johns Hopkins University Press. And I should just mention that there's also a British, a UK uh, edition, which is To Meet in Hell. And you can see that I furnished both publishers with the same images. And you can see how different the covers came out with both Rachel on top, my mother, and Glenn Hughes on the bottom. And here Glenn Hughes is on top and Rachel's on the bottom. But they both got the same images and the different titles. But here in the US, it's All the Horrors of War, Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, uh, let me say that, uh, that I prefer the British title. Um, in one, I, I prefer the British title. Uh, in one sense, uh, having read the book, they did meet in hell. Well, Samantha, neither, you, neither I, were my, I had, I have to tell you, I had title fatigue. By the time the book was published, I had a list of possible titles, so I, I, I can't even think about it. But anyway, this one is To Meet in Hell, Bergen Belsen, the British officer who liberated it, and the Jewish girl he saved. Yeah. And you certainly can. You certainly can get it from Amazon. You certainly can get it from John Ho Johns Hopkins University Press, and um, someday you may even be able to get it uh, at um, that ancient artifact called the bookstore. That's right. Um, so we'll take some questions from the audience now, and uh, we do have a limited time, so I'll do my best to get as many in as possible. Uh, so Bernice, we have a lot of questions about your mother and your relationship with your mother. Um, let me go through a few of them and sort of bunch them together so you could answer in the limited time that we have. So this one, it comes from Kathleen Stone. She asks, had your mother previously told you about her town and the camp? Um, or did the book cause you to have a new conversation with her? And how did that change your relationship with her? Uh, Christina Nilsson also asks uh, she, uh, how the relationship between you and your mother changed, if at all, during the co course of your research. And um, Jan Schwartz asks, uh, so what did your mother think of you writing this book? Was she okay with it? Did she understand how you felt the mission? 
or was she fearful? So if you could just expand on um, your relationship with her a bit, that'd be great. And so, let's add one. Let's add one more. Is your mother alive? Yeah, my mother's alive. Please God, she's watching this webinar. She is 90 years old. Um, she's one of the youngest survivors of Auschwitz and the death camps on Long Island, I think, maybe. She is, um, up until this coronavirus, she was speaking to school groups. She had many engagements that got canceled, but she's spoken to more than 250 school groups about her experience, and so I'm very proud of her because she was a very shy person. She is a lovely human being. Um, she's a wonderful, wonderful person, wonderful, caring mother. and. Um, but she's my mother, so she sometimes it's annoying when your mother cares too much about you, right? They're worried about you. But um, she was, our relationship did not change over the course of the writing of the book. We always talked. We always talked about everything, a lot of things, not just about the Holocaust, about everything. And she's wise. And she learned a lot of things that she didn't know before. Uh, that most survivors don't know. I think I have four aunts who also survived Bergen Bells, and I don't think that they, maybe one of them knew they were liberated by the British. The other others, I don't think most, I think they were so sick and out of it uh, at 75 years ago today. I don't think that the British did not get Jewish. It's not what you would expect of a liberation. Um, the people were so there was the movements were so slow and people were dying by, by the way that's, so she that, learned, she for, learned for the audience that's a very important point because if you contrast that with a camp that did not have an epidemic Buchenwald you have all of these incredible photographs of everybody cheering the arrival of the allies and at Bergen-Belsen the camp is so far gone that uh, a whimper is a cheer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very few were in shape to really greet their liberators. A few, but. Um, so anyway, she learned, she learned what happened when she fell unconscious. When she fell unconscious, she learned what, how she, she learned about something called the human laundry, which you'll see in the book, and she learned what happened to her. And she learned about Glenn Hughes, and she, and she learned some broader context of some of the things that when survivors go through it themselves, and especially your kid, you don't see the bigger picture of what was happening during the war. So I think she saw drafts, everything that I wrote about her, she saw drafts of as I was going along. And I think it was very moving for her. And I think it's really, I'm so grateful she's alive and it's so important to both of us. And She's the only survivor now. She survived with one sister, but now she's the only one alive from a family, a large family. And I name her aunts and uncles and my grandparents and her younger siblings. And if not for this, they would have vanished from the earth without a trace. So we lifted some of the, some of the six million into bold relief and we're both relieved to have it in print, yeah. Well, you, you'll be happy to know uh, Bernice, that your opinion is shared by several people. Your opinion of your mother is shared by several people who are on this call, uh, who are on this uh, program, who know your mother and speak of her uh, glowingly and powerfully, and um, uh, who have heard her speak. And one says she's the loveliest, uh, most humanistic family I've ever known. Uh, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, no, I'm very, very, I really lucked out in that department. My father was kind and loving and warm as well. Yeah. Um, we so how did you grow up the way you did then? <laughs> no, I just got lucky. I just got lucky. They came from loving families, both of them. Yeah. Uh, so these next questions actually focus more on uh, Glenn Hughes, uh, the doctor. Um, so. I'll, I'll do the same. I'll, I'll bunch together the, the similar questions. This one comes from Louis Stolman. He asks, what did you find out about uh, the physician's upbringing and his family that accounted for his remarkable and even her Herculean efforts to save Jewish lives? And Stuart a uh, Abrams also asks, if there is any correlation you can make between uh, Dr. Hughes' difficulties uh, that he went through and his heroic behavior at Bergen-Belsen. Yeah. So 
I personally, I'm not a psychologist, but I think that um, he experienced a liberation of a sort in his own life. He was, his father died when he was two years old. His father was a doctor and he died in the line of saving another human being. And um, so he had that, but he, so his mother, they were in South Africa and his mother moved with him back to uh, England, to Wales. And um, he, he was a very sickly, infirm child. He was diagnosed by a, a, a doctor as having a spinal deformity and he was confined. Can you imagine like a six, seven year old who's active, who likes to run around? He was confined to this thing called a spinal carriage where he had to be wheeled everywhere. And then uh, several years later, he wound up at age 11 going, starting this boarding school for the sons of medical men. Medical men were a disadvantaged class because so many of them were dying on their job and they weren't earning a lot in England in those years. And this boarding school transformed him. He had such a rise, a meteoric rise, a liberation in this place. He was among men, he was among boys. He wrote, he was, an, he became an athlete. He became, he, and he just became so strong and healthy. So he had this experience. So his, his early childhood, he, he was marked. He, he was, his prognosis was terrible. And then he had this unbelievable success, this physical success. And he became, he also was very interested in War. He loved war. His happiest years of his life were in World War I when he was a regimental medical officer. Uh, while he was in medical school, he was taken there. and He served for longer than any other regimental medical officer, and he knew every one of his 600-plus men by name, and he would pick up arms and go into battle next to the men, beside the men, taking care of their wounds on the battlefield. He was just that's the kind of character he was. He didn't think of himself. So that's a little bit about his background. And, and later in his life, after Bergenbels, and he was affected in other ways that I sort of see this thread throughout his life in terms of how people are cared for, which is all in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and Judy asks, Judy Zomer asks, if he also received recognition for his heroic deeds um, in England. Yeah. So he got, he was the most highly decorated British medical officer in the Royal Army Medical Corps. Um, and for his, his deeds, for his work in Bergen-Belsen, he was recognized by President Truman. And he, he did get a lot of honors and recognition. We tried, his, not me, but Epsom College, the, college, the school he went to, tried very hard to nominate him for uh, Righteous Among the Gentiles at Yad Vashem, but they they disqualified him. They put together quite an impressive package, but they disqual disqualified him because he wasn't well, during the war. Right. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, let's let's um, let's be fair to Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem has explicit and rigorous. One could even say all too rigorous criteria. Uh, number one, you had to save Jewish lives at the risk of your life for no reward whatsoever during the war. And um, the problem of during the war becomes a, um, uh, uh, an issue and at the risk of your own life uh, might become an issue as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a, a different story, but yeah. let's not say disqualify. He didn't, but, yeah. he didn't meet their criteria. He's certainly uh, a he wonderful. Meet, right. But he did, he was honored by Yad Vashem UK posthumously in 2007 at a big, big event with attended by a thousand people and dignitaries from all over. So he was honored. Okay, <laughs> Samantha, next question. Um, next question. We have many to choose from. Um, we have a question from Rilly Myron. How many of Bernice's family members survived the Holocaust? I think you mentioned a few aunts that did. My, what I, I read recently that there was no one at Bergen Belsen who survived who didn't lose most of their family. But in my case, my mother did lose most of her family. Only she and her sister survived. But my father, 
had a miraculous, a miraculous thing happen out of his family of eight children during the war, six survived. So that's why I have ants who survived also. So that's, yeah, so that's who survived. So I have, and they all, every, except for one, every one of my aunts and uncles married other survivors. So I grew up with aunts and uncles and cousins. That's incredible. Um, yeah. So we have time for just one more question. Uh, let, let me see here. Sorry, there, there are many. Um, okay, so this one comes from Tony Litwinko, um, who, Tony and Dorian, they ask, they, first there's a comment. Uh, they say that they were, Tony was three in Bergen-Belsen when his parents' grandmother uh, were put on the lost transport, uh, which crisscrossed Germany until April 23rd when they were liberated by the Russians. And the question is, do you know how many inmates were removed from Bergen-Belsen by the time it was liberated? Had been removed like he on these kind of transports out? Mm -hmm. Was that, so that's, I don't know. And I don't know if there are any records of it, but it was kind of crazy at that time in the war. I mean, they were removing some people. More people were coming in. I, most, almost, almost half of the people that were found by the liberators in Bergen-Belsen had arrived within seven to 10 days before the camp was liberated. Those were the ones who were in a little bit better shape. But then there were some transports they were taking out for different reasons. Not too many, but there were a few trains that left. I think, I think the best way to describe the situation was total and complete chaos yeah. and total and complete breakdown of the entire system. Yeah. And therefore, um, anybody, nobody can give you numbers because nobody was taking records and there may not have been any rhyme or reason why one group was treated one way and another group was treated another way. Best way to look at it is, is absolute and complete chaos. Yeah. Samantha, before we begin, uh, before we end, let me suggest two things. Number one, I think we should um, um, have a moment of enormous gratitude to the liberators and express um, they can't, they came for many, they came late, but when they came, these warriors became healers, and that was an incredible achievement. And let's have a moment of silence in memory of all those who died at Bergen-Belsen, both before and after liberation. May their memory serve as a blessing and as a warning. Thank you so much for that, Michael and Bernice. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I wish that we could continue this conversation, but our viewers watching and listening from home uh, should definitely uh, buy your book. Uh, it's out now from Johns Hopkins University Press, um, wherever books are available for purchase. Um, thank you. Thank you so very much again. Uh, I'll close with this comment from one of our viewers, Deanne, who says the impact of stories like these put a face on history in ways that can re resonate among so many today. And I, and I think we can all agree with that. So um, be uh, before we sign off, I want to once again, thank all of the hundreds of you viewers who joined us this afternoon. And uh, if you can, please help to support the museum with a donation. Any contributions right now help us to stay afloat during this very difficult period. So in order uh, to donate, you can visit us at mjhnyc.info uh, forward slash donate. That's again, mjhnyc.info slash donate. Um, and, and, the name of the and the name of the museum again, Samantha, say it out loud because we've gotten a couple of notes of they want to know. That's the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York City. All right. Thank, thank you, Michael. you, Michael. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you all, everyone who joined in. Thank you. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.